Hello, everybody. Please welcome Roberto Clapis for um, his uh, keynote, the first uh, talk of today, Things You Didn't Know About Go and How to Become an Expert. Please welcome Roberto. So there was some code that needed to do this simple task. Take a couple of HTTP headers that were called X test something, I put some numbers just to make them fit the slide, and turn them into non-test headers by taking the something, so in this case the zero and the one, and putting them in their place, and those would be the header keys. This is, um, I think, simple enough piece of code, and like, this was the code, the one in bold here. Um, it would just range over the headers, uh, remove the prefix, the X test prefix, and uh, set the new key with a known test value, and delete the test one. So basically, these three lines of code were the entirety of the code that I got for a code review. So I was doing code review. I get a change list that does something like that. Looks good until I realize something is weird about this code. But if you look at tests, this works. Like, at the end, the headers look like they're supposed to. So there is a header zero and a header one. They have a known test value. And this was working fine um, for the person who wrote this code. But then I said, what happens if instead of having two headers, you now have 10? And I would like you to picture in your mind what would happen in this case. Like, previous code, two headers, prints the two headers non-test value, and zero, and one. New code does the very same thing, but 10 times. Um, someone that is in their right mind uh, would expect this code to print 10 headers. Some would expect maybe to print one less, one more, like this is still weird code. Well, this code panics. And this is the point where you start reevaluating your career choices. Because, like, it worked for two, it worked for one, why doesn't it work for 10? And, like, this is the depiction of me when I was trying this code on my machine because the first thing that I did was copy it on my laptop and try to figure out what was going on. And this brings me to the point, main point of this talk, which is, <laughs> like, working in tech, <laughs> It's hard. This was me before I started studying computer science. I had hair, okay? I had hair. And I'm not saying that correlation implies causation, but come on. So, welcome to my talk. Um, this is things you didn't know and I didn't know about Go, and how to become an expert. Spoiler, I'm not an expert, but I've been told that you can become one. Um, I've been a software engineer at Google for a while now. I mostly work on the security for the web platform, so Go is not my main focus, but I do like Go. And um, I do a lot of code reviews. That is mostly what I do uh, nowadays, uh, you know, to share uh, some pain with the person who is writing the code. And let me tell you, it's super nice to finally see people in person, because the last time that I gave a talk at a conference, it was remote, and um, I had to send like a recording of myself speaking. So during the talk, there was a version of me talking and a version of me replying to the chat's question and <laughs> the awkwardness. So it's, it's really nice to finally talk to people. And um, I, staring at a screen is nice up to a point, unless you're doing debugging. Debugging is fine, like the best activity of them all especially if you need to debug things that deal with context. Um, don't get me wrong, like, I do like context in Go, but it's not maybe the best type to inspect. So if you print a context, that context, it doesn't give you much. Sometimes you need to really look inside the context, so I thought, maybe I can just marshal it, you know? Print the context. Now, I would like for you all, so take a look at this code that just creates a context with one key and one value, marshals it at JSON, and figure out 
what this code might print. Some of you might think this prints nothing because context, again, is not inspectable, but JSON, the JSON package has a tendency of inspecting inside an interface to see what the actual concrete type is. Some of you might think, well, but this point, that those keys and those values are probably not exported and the JSON package only prints uh, exported fields, but I'm pretty sure that none of you expected these to be printed out, which first, why does it tell me it's a context? Usually JSON, JSON doesn't print a type. And why is zero? Like this, was, this, is, this, this is me trying to debug and this is me last Christmas. Figure out, like, find a difference. But anyways, this is what happens when I have these kind of behaviors. Um, I looked at the context value and I realized that it embeds a context it's always like, if you embed the interfaces in your struct, I have two things to ask you. Um, please don't. And if you really have to, can you leave a comment on the why? Like, when you embed an interface inside your struct, you basically propagate the behavior, and you propagate a lot of things with that, and it's just called with the name of the type. And in this case, the empty context that was inside it, I, I figured out it's just an integer. So context background is equal to zero. It, it just has some method attached. But not JSON Marshall. Not JSON Marshall. But time does. So <laughs> this is a struct that, again, I needed to serialize. Came with a time. I wanted it to behave exactly like a time. I wanted all of the methods of time. And then I wanted to annotate this timestamp with what it was. For example, start. Uh, didn't seem like something too crazy to me. I just wanted to, you know, say if it was the start at the end or any midpoint, and I and I encoded it. Uh, I serialized it. Um, on the other side of this program, I didn't have a Go software, so on the other side, I was just calling um, JSON parse on on the browser. Um, does anyone want to try and guess? if this prints an actual curly braced JSON? Like, who thinks this prints a JSON? Like, a valid curly braced JSON. Who hopes, who really thinks it should print a JSON? I see more hands, nice, thank you. Um, well, it turns out, well, just to check, who think this prints a string? Like, just a string, a quoted string? Nice. This is exactly what it does. And can you imagine my surprise looking at this and going like, but where's my string? <laughs> I added a start string there. Where did it write it? Like, what, what is going on? And um, I can understand, like, the string was unexported, but the curly braces, like, the type, what, what is going on? Figured out, um, if you embed a type, yes, you get all of the behaviors of that type, including marshalling including serialization. So basically for the JSON package, this, was a, this had a method on it that serialized it, proving that the method came from a type that I embedded. And um, I was not happy, because then I needed to just make the time a field, ooh, a field of destruct, and just implement a lot of things by hand, forward methods. You can't just, you know, um, get part of the behavior unless you rewrite methods. It, it was a hassle. So at, at this point, I was like, is there any way to predict these things? How do we catch these things before they happen? And uh, uh, there are ways uh, to catch these things. For example, summon the ancient gods of knowledge. Um, do some sacrifices, like you can, I don't know, paper shred your tablet and pray that it stops having bugs. It works. It, starts, it stops misbehaving as soon as you shred it. I, I, I can assess that. Um, but that wasn't a very scalable option. I can't just all of, ask all of my users to stop being users. So I decided to um, look into it. And I stumbled across a very interesting topic, which is expertise. Uh, I've read this myth 
of expertise that if you become an expert on things, you stop being surprised and like tripped by those things. So I've been told, at least um, most experts don't agree with me, which is always nice. Um, and so today I would like to share a couple of things with you, which are about what is an environment that allows you to be an expert, and what are like the three steps you can simply take to become an expert. Um, and then you can tell me if it worked, actually, in a couple of years or so, or don't, I don't know. Um, it's hard to check. The two most important things when you work in an environment are the validity of that environment and the consistency of that environment. And I can give you an example. If I tell you 2 plus 2 is 4, no one is going to be surprised. But if you tell you that in my special language, that is true only on Tuesday, you're going to start wondering what is going on and why am I talking to you and who am I. But except for those very basic questions, if I try to explain you the reasoning, maybe sometimes you can realize the logic behind it. And about that, I actually had this conversation. Who here has ever seen a YAML file? Okay, oh, I'm so sorry, folks. What happened to you all? Like, uh, why? <laughs> sorry. Um, I had this problem in a server that it would regularly crash at 8 a.m. every day. And I was like, okay, but it works the rest of the time. And it's not like it was using too, much resor too many resources. It was just crash at 8 a.m., precisely at 8 a.m. And I had no idea what was going on. And uh, I spent a full week debugging step by step until I realized, OK, let's try something silly. Let's set the time of my laptop to 8 a.m. and restart the debugger. And the program crashed. And you know why? Who has a guess on why that could happen? Nice. And considering that all of you have written YAML, this makes me feel less bad about myself. Um, when you write time, you usually serialize it from a string or a time that prints the leading zero. So 8 a.m. is 0800. This server was starting every two hours, and 0600 is a valid octal number. 0800 is not a valid octal number, and in YAML, if you lead with a zero, you're saying, this is written in octal, in base eight, and so it would fail to parse. And, uh, well, one thing that I really like about Go is that unlike YAML and other languages, it is consistent. You can take a look at like, this slide, and I don't think that for any of you this is surprising at all. Even if you have never used Go, this should look like it's fine. You parse a float, and it gives you that value. You parse um, an integer, and it gives you that value. You parse a float as an integer, and it complains. It usually says an invalid syntax or like any error message. If you try to pass a number to a function that accepts a string, it will just refuse to compile. This is important because it, it tells you that this language is consistent. You know that you can trust the language to tell you something is wrong. Now, um, who? Oh. A slide is missing. Um, but like, who of you here uses JavaScript? Who knows what happens if you call parse int in JavaScript on the last line? If you try to parse int that number, that 0 0.0003. Who wants to guess that it, gets, that it gives an invalid, an invalid syntax? No one? Who wants to say that it will return zero? One would expect that JavaScript that doesn't have a statically strongly typed uh, runtime would give zero. It gives three. Which, um, it's interesting because if you remove a zero from that number, it gives zero. So, that is less consistent, I would say. Um, because in order to accept a string, it casts an integer to the string which, if the integer is small enough, will go to exponential notation. So it will type like 3, e, 10, e minus 10. And so the leading digit is 3. Um, 
not consistent. Not saying that you can't be an expert in JavaScript, of course you can, but if you find an, a JavaScript expert, please tell me I need them so bad. Um, <laughs> going back to the initial issue, I didn't explain to you what was going on here. We had our headers, um, I switched from 2 to 10, There's, the code started panicking. Um, the trick here is that in order to range over a map, um, you need to be careful because you can't change the map while you range over it. And this is in the spec. Like, the specification says that if a map entry is created during iteration and setting a header or deleting a header kind of counts, um, that entry may be produced during the iteration or may be skipped. You don't know. Their language reserves the right to change behavior. So, um, depending on the implementation of, the, of Go that you're using, depending on how many times you iterate, you might end up with seeing the entry that you just created in your next iteration. And of course, if you create a header that has one character and you try to remove the prefix from it, it will crash. And if you do code reviews or you write Go and you see someone changing a map while iterating on it, this is a big no-no. And by this, I don't mean that you should read the spec. I always advise against reading the spec first. Like, you don't go into a language by reading the spec and then using the language. That's not how Go works. You first use the language, have fun with it, and when it hits you in the face with something like the code, you go like, huh, I wonder what's going on. And that's when you read the spec, or cry, or both. Why not? Who am I to tell you what to do? Um, collections in Go are funky, like map. Uh, but one thing that I think everyone uses here are slices. Slices are our safe, reliable, memory-checked uh, memory container uh, or, of sorts. And this is why it's always fun when you write code like this. Like you have a, a slice of size 1, you append a number to it, and it becomes of size 2. It's very straightforward. And then you take a slice of that, and you append an item to both. And of course, in this case, I append a 1 to A, and I check what the value is at the end. And it returns 1. Very consistent, very valid, love it. This is one of the things that I love about Go. Which is why it's particularly puzzling to understand why if I start from size 2, this code changes behavior. So if instead of starting from a slice that is 1 big, I start from a slice that is 2 big, Appending a number to B changes the value in A. And does any, have, does any of you have any idea on why this is the case? What's your opinion? OK, so the answer was that the backing array was big enough already. And this is exactly what is going on. Like, when you create a slice, what you're telling Go is like, I need a chunk of memory. You can decide how large it is, but I just want to see that much of it. This is why it's called a slice. You just see a slice of it. And well, in the first initial case, when the slice is one big, there is a special case. Go gives you just one slot in which you can write things. Every time you append to it, it needs to grow it. In this case, it sees that you started from two, and two is larger than one, at least last time I checked it was. And so Go is like, two is strictly more than just one value. Let's get some space so people can add more values if they need. And in this case, when you add to it, effectively, you're just rewriting the same array. So when you append, you're rewriting the same array. And again, this is in the spec. There is nothing surprising about this if you know the spec by heart, which I'm pretty sure no one does. Ugh. Most people don't. Um, but this is a surprising behavior. Like, if you see these in a, in a simple snippet, like the one that was on the slide, it's super easy to find if you know this specific bit of the, of the spec. But sometimes, those things slip, especially if you're looking at a, some very complicated logic. You see that a function is allocating a slice, passing it to another function needs to copy it over. Those things are really easy to miss in code review, and especially when writing code. Um, because the fix to this snippet of code was that. 
And can anyone, can anybody say that they have used three index slicing in their production code? Ah, the person who knew the answer. <laughs> So I guess you've been beaten by this before. So yeah, when you need to grow a slice and you don't want that to share too much, because sharing is caring, but sometimes it's too much, um, you need to tell it to stop growing. And um, this is something that a lot of people miss, including me. And um, just, um, I thought it was worth mentioning to you all, so you will not make the same mistake that I did. Who here uses pointer arithmetic in C code or stuff like that? Mm, there is more than one hand raised. I'm uh, sorry. Um, why? Wait, like you're you're interested in many things. I see, uh, like hurting yourself, like I do. So in Go, pointer arithmetic doesn't exist, which is something that makes me really, really happy because I'm terrible at that. And um, when I write code like this. I really wish it behaves. So I create a variable, and I print a pointer to that variable. And then I call a function that doesn't use that variable, and I print the pointer to the variable again. Now, we are like 20 minutes into this talk, so I'm pretty sure that all of you know that this is not going to turn out nice. So who thinks this prints two different values? Who hopes? It doesn't print two different values. You, it does print two different values. Now, um, the first time I saw this, I was debugging. And there are two ways of debugging things, using printf and the one that I can't use. Um, I, so I debug with printf. Uh, sorry about this, this news. I wish I could use a debugger. Um, it's very hard to run a debugger in production in some environments, so this is the tool that I have, Printlen. And trying to follow pointers if they move is not the easiest thing. Um, moving pointers like shifting sands, beautiful until you, have, you need to step in it. Um, that is the function. That is the function that I'm calling, and that is uh, making the mess and moving variables. It's a recursive function that calls itself thousand times and then returns. Um, who here knows what is this about, or at least can guess what this is about? OK, this is interesting because I see five hands raised, and I'm very happy about this because if you're using Go, or like even if you're an experienced gopher and you never encounter this issue, it means that Go is doing a great job as, at protecting you from these kind of internals. It means that you can use Go and treat it as valid as consistent until you, like me, end up debugging with printf. So this is nice. And what is going on here is that that function requires a lot of stack. And Go doesn't use the stack. All of Go routines run in the heap. So if you need more stack, at one point Go needs to stop the word, move your stack to a larger slice of memory, copy everything over, and since the pointers have changed, adjust all the pointers as it goes and restart your function. This introduces a very small pause because our CPUs have become amazing at copying contiguous memory, so this usually doesn't affect performance. But it is really surprising when you see it happening, and maybe you're debugging stuff, and all of you, the pointers switch while you're looking at them, and you're like, Ooh, -hoo. I was looking at a magic trick and I didn't know about that. I thought I was working today. So these things are uh, some of the inconsistency, inconsistencies of Go. But there are ways that you can avoid them. Um, please don't rely on implementation-specific behaviors. Like if you have something that relies on implementation, stop. Like first, there is not just one Go compiler, and second, do you, don't you like to sleep at night? Like, don't push the prod code that relies on internals. And um, if you have doubts, don't guess. Don't try to invent what is going on. If you see that something is behaving not as expected, like the, example that I showed, the examples that I showed you in this chapter, um, look at the spec, try to figure out what is going on, and then write it in a comment. 
Like, if you add a weird line of code, like the triple slicing, add a comment saying, hey, th this is what I'm doing here, and this is why, and maybe link to the spec if you're, um, if you're allowed to, but don't make up information, because there is nothing as bad as trying to become an expert by guesswork, because you become an expert on wrong things, and that's so hard to correct. Believe me, I, I'm a self-taught programmer, and it took a while to learn how to program uh, properly. I mean, it's still taking a while. Um, in general, those are my personal suggestions. Um, the other ones were more like generally agreed. This is my beef. Like, don't you the, don't use DSLs, like domain-specific languages. I've seen a lot of people use testing frameworks that allow you to basically write a sentence that compiles to Go, but it looks like natural language. And when you're trying to debug those tests, you get very nice poetry, but nothing that looks like code, and when you get some surprising behavior, that means that you not, not only need to learn, learn the language, but also the library, and also hope that the library is consistent, because not every library implementa implementation follows consistency. And uh, believe me, making your library easy to become an expert on is much more valuable than making it smart. Um, the second most important thing about expertise is feedback. Can I have a show of hands for people that have to go through code review before they submit code? That is good. Has it ever happened to you that someone pointed out something that you didn't know during the code review? See a lot of nodding. <laughs> yeah. This is something very important. Timely feedback, and a lot of feedback, is the core part of learning and becoming an expert. So it takes time, but there is also one more thing that is uh, discounted. It's like how much time intercourse between the thing that you write and the time you get feedback on it. And this is very important. This code is the first piece of Go that I've written in my life. I found out about Go routines and I was so happy about it, so I just spawned 10 of them, and I wanted them to just, you know, um, run and print their index. Now, this code doesn't print the numbers from 1 to 9. Uh, this code prints 10 times 10, which was sort of surprising. Um, the reason for these is that when you print a variable from a goroutine, that might have changed in the meantime. And I see some people frowning by looking at these, and yes, it is surprising. And it is one of the most surprising things about Go, I think. So what people ended up doing was implement a check in GoVat that now warns you if you do that. Now, this is something that you would find out about in tests or in production. Like, this is code that would break very soon, but the, Go, the people in the Go um, language decided to move the feedback even shorter to when you write, so that GoVet now tells you that you're closing over a variable, and you shouldn't be doing that because you're using it in a Go routine. This is important because people that have been surprised by these probably have never written code by, like these, but people that are not surprised by these probably got that warning or got beaten in prod. And this is the key thing. That i variable exists only once in memory. But you don't want to think about that when you write code. You want to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. So the tooling should hit you every time you do something you shouldn't be doing. <clears throat> this was turned from a very rare occasion that most people didn't know about to something that more people are knowing about. This is a slightly common issue, and GoVet warns about it. And now I get to something immediate. Like, if you write code like this, you will like, immediately figure out where the error is. But um, this is like less frequent than others. Um, function f has a context, and before it can cancel it, when, when it gets cancelled, it wants to do other things. Like in this case, after calling the previous cancel from the previous context, it prints a thing. And then it returns a new context. In the main function, I just, I just call it, 
I just call it and call the cleanup. Um, who thinks this code compiles? Let's start easy. Easy. <laughs> this code actually compiles. Um, who thinks that I should stop hammering you with code that I would never write in production? <laughs> okay, okay, I see. You're still with me. Um, this code was actually, I actually found it in a code review. It's just that it was very rare that that context would get cancelled. So this would usually not happen. Uh, but if you, run, if you were to run this code, you would get a stack overflow, not the site, the painful thing. Well, I guess both are a bit of pain. Um, but yeah, so this code was one of the most surprising things uh, that I had to point out in a code review. Raise your hands if you figured out why there is a stack overflow in this code. Exactly. So um, if you look at this, it's similar to a lot of code you've seen. Like you get a context, usually from the caller, um, you do your things, you prepare a cancellation function, and you return that cancellation function. Um, but there is a major mistake in this code, which is that. Uh, have you ever used named return values, like having a variable named in the return? Nice. A lot of, I see a lot of hands. This is very useful when you need to document your code. Because if you return, let's say, an integer, that could be anything. But if you return an integer which is called HTTP error status, it's kind of understandable. So there is a good reason for naming your variables. The problem is then when you use it in your code. Because that console gets assigned with console2 when you return. The return variable gets assigned when you return, which means that now this call doesn't call cancel. It calls cancel2. So it's a recursive function that calls itself and it crashes and uses a lot of memory, surprisingly. So imagine having a server in production that runs and runs and runs. Everything is fine. And then immediately you see a spike in memory and a, and a, and a crash um, because usually you don't have that much memory on a very small server. And this is why you should, well, feel free to name your functions um, but, and your return values, but maybe do not you know, use them inside the body of your function. Use local variables and just return. Um, this is quite rare, but it is immediate. Like the moment you cancel this context, it gives you feedback. This is the single most nasty bug that I've seen, and this was in, in code that should have been like safe. Like this ran in production for a very long time. It acquires a mutex lock. It defers mutex unlock. It performs two operations, and it returns. Who has written code like this? Who is now? fearing what comes in the next slide. <laughs> the, the, the worst thing that could happen, and like this happened to me during a talk, I was giving a talk about security, and um, I presented a vulnerability, and a person from the audience literally walked up to the desk that was behind the corner and started typing on the laptop, and after the talk I went to them, I was like, what is going on? And he was like, I need to fix a vulnerability in production. So, <laughs> I hope this doesn't happen today, but this code is incorrect. And the reason is that this function could panic. If next B panics, what happens is that you have set the value of A based on the parameter that you got. So you got a value, you computed a value for A, which is part of your struct, and you assigned it to A. And then you were computing the value for B, 
but you got interrupted because you panicked, so this assignment never happened. So now you return, you unlock the mutex, the code can continue, but you are in a corrupted state. This state is not correct. So basically, screwed up the logic of your server, and sometimes you write this struct to the database, so you completely corrupted the state of your production code because you deferred this unlock. Now, should you move this line to the last line? Please don't, because then if you panic, you deadlock. I, I mean, eh, no, it's a fix, I guess, but not the best fix, because dead code is safe code. <coughs> um, this is how I ended up fixing it. So I added three methods to my struct. The first one, starting a transaction. Starting a transaction acquires the mutex and saves the state of S to a field of S. Like, I back up everything. And then I defer end transaction. I do, my, I do my task, and at the end, I say, I am done. Everything went fine. And then I return. So this code and transaction checks a state variable to see if it is turned to true. If it is true, everything went fine, deallocates the memory for the backup, and your code can continue. If it is still false, so you didn't commit the transaction, it reverts the previous state of S. And um, this is the correct way of implementing mutex-based um, code if your functions can panic. Now, which functions can panic? Hard to say, because you could panic for anything. Even you go too deep in the stack, you divide by zero. It's very hard to uh, detect what is going to panic. So this code looks overly defensive, but it, it saved me a couple of headaches. Um, All in all, there are many important tools that you have in your tool set. Code review, and if you don't have anyone that can review your code, there are links, I have a link to the slides at the end, uh, there are links that you can follow that help you go through your own code and do some self-code uh, review. Peer programming, broadly underestimated tool. I wish I could do more of it because the distance between your, your mistakes and the feedback you get is immediately zero. Like, you're typing and the person next to you goes like, uh, what you're doing? Oh, well, that's not good code. Can you stop? And like the, that kind of immediate banter and feedback makes you learn much faster than any other tool that I've used. Some tooling, like static check, helps you learn things um, faster. And writing tests around the time you write the code. I've seen a lot of people send a change list with tests and then implementing the code. OK, fine, if it is too large to review at once, but it's preferable to send some bits of code with their tests and work with them together, because those two things should be as close as possible in time. And fudzing. Who here writes fuds tests? Uh, folks, start. <laughs> don't, don't do this to me. Um, fuds tests are quite easy to write in Go, because they feel and look like uh, unit tests. It really, like the Go team did an amazing job at making this possible because it, it really looks like a unit test, but it can find edge cases that you didn't think about. And this is fundamental because fuzzing can find in like 20 seconds an edge case that you didn't think about. You don't need to fuzz on the cloud or fuzz continuously. Just write your test and run them, I don't know, once, and then keep the corpus and use that as a unit test. That's already enough to find a lot of uh, bugs. Use your code and give your, your users a way to give, you fit, to give some feedback. Like, there are very, if, you, if your users don't have a way to tell you what is wrong in your code, you're missing out. You're losing the chance to become an expert on those things, and you're frustrating them immensely. Every time I use an application that crashes and I don't see any way to report an issue, I'm always annoyed. Um, and then there is time. Uh, how much does it take to become an expert? It really depends. Like, some people say 10,000 hours, some people say five years, some people say that it depends how much of your previous field you can use in the next field. Did anyone use, um, did anyone use Java before Go? Probably most of the things that you did uh, that you did with Go, 
um, looked like Java. So this is important, and you can carry that over. And it's not a bull, like it grows organically. And then I had other slides, which were about get out of your comfort zone, um, which is doing the same things over and over don't give you much. And when people tell you, we have always done things this way, push back. Try to find a way to find a different way, maybe in your own time, just, just find a way of improving and seeing something different, otherwise you will never learn. And, um, and then if you do things again and again, the way that I told you, and you keep doing those, also, who gets the reference here? I am old, I am so old. Sorry, this is a meme from the beginning of YouTube. Um, at one point, a lot of the things that I showed you in these slides become natural to you. You don't need to think about them, they just come out, you look at code, you understand it, it's simple, and you can focus on the problems at hand. And please, stop doing the thing where you keep doubting yourself. A, a bit of humbleness is fine, but don't always second-guess yourself. If you have been using the same technology for enough time, you got a lot of feedback, assume that you know what you're doing. Stop you know, thinking that every one of your colleagues is better than you. That's not true. Maybe they are on some fields, but you are on your own. So get some confidence. Like, be confident on your things, but not a software engineering. You can't be an expert software engineer. And there is a good reason for that. The environment, environment of software engineering is not valid and is not consistent because the users of your code are humans and humans are not consistent, at least. I mean, have you seen how people behaved in the pandemic? That's, if that's not a proof for my statement, I don't know what is. But like, we deal with users and users are inconsistent. The needs change and they keep shifting. The feedback that you get comes after months when you designed, so it's practically impossible to become an expert software engineer. So the best thing that I can tell you is ask around. Put together the expertise of anyone that you know in your team that is able to design and architect your, the code and work together with them. Um, stop being overconfident and say, yeah, I can design this thing, this is a simple problem. No, ask everyone, why is this a problem? Like, why is this a hard problem? Can we make it? become hard. We have a rule in my team, which is when everybody agrees on a decision, the last person to vote has to disagree and explain why. Because if everybody agrees, you're missing the point. There is always a problem, you're just not seeing it. And um, this is a recap, which is go for valid and consistent environments, get a lot of timely and good quality feedback, and get out of your comfort zone, experiment, dig into stuff you don't understand. If you have personal projects, start them and fail fast. Like, it's fine if you start a personal project, you work on it five hours and you give up. This is how you get the most out of it. Like, who has at least an unfinished project on their personal GitHub? That's how you learn. You started it because you were curious about something, you tried out, you learned. That's it, your brain told you, this is what we got what we wanted, and you just listened to it. You learned from it, and that was it. That's, it served its purpose. Don't feel bad for it. That's the right thing to do. And, and that was my talk. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think we can do a round of questions. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, then I'll come to you. If there are no questions, I have questions for you, so you better get asking. <laughs> there is a question there. Thank you for your talk. Um, there is a bit of eco, but... Um, you said a thing that uh, hit me, which is uh, when you have an unfinished project and you stop because your brain told, okay, that's enough. But consistency and pushing through has a value as well. So where do you put the line? Okay, I got most of it or 
I should push a bit through. I hope my question makes sense, so yeah, thank you. So if I got it right, your question is, you told me to stop and fail fast on my personal project, but also only with consistency you actually get the most of it. And um, the answer is depends what your purpose. Like, if you're doing a personal project because you need it to work and give you some value, you need to finish that. If you're working on a personal project because you want to learn from the finishing details, like you want to see how to actually finish and furbish an application, maybe build a smaller one, but you have to go through. If instead you see a new technology and you want to try it out and learn as much, stop. So the, the point is that what do you go in for? And this is a good exercise in general, and I guess like in life, if you're about to start something because it excites you, try to understand why, because that is how you get the most of any life experience, not just software engineering in general. Like, I did many things automatically just because it's the thing that everybody was doing, but I figured out that most of the time they were just wrong <laughs> because we are different people and for me some things didn't work. In general, figure out your pace, but do that. I use a lot of words to say nothing, but <clears throat> listen to yourself. Very quotable day. Um, you showed earlier a slide where there was a security problem because you had a mutex and yeah. um, without extra care, a panic could uh, cause problems. So what's your opinion on having a policy to just never attempt to recover from a panic? Making panics basically just a crash all the time. I like that question. Actually, since we are at Go slash Rust Lab, uh, Rust has an interesting approach to this. If you um, like, not if you don't clear up your work after using a mutex, I don't know how confident you are with Rust, so I'm going to stay generic. Like you basically end up poisoning the mutex. So basically, you say I panicked. I don't know the state of anything that is in this mutex. Uh, abort. Everybody that touches this thing should not continue. This is poisoned. Um, there is also the problem with panics, like in general not recovering from panics, as you said. Um, so your question is, sorry, I've got derailed. Your question is what, is, what do I think about the policy of recovering from panics, of, not reco of never recovering from panics? I have a server in production that handles six billion requests per day. I will have one panic. My server needs to stay up, so I can't. I basically can't do that. My RPC server has a like root recover because sometimes I get some panics that are unpredictable. I parse user input, I parse unprocessed data. I need to stay up. Point is, I think the most important thing is the most important thing is when you write code for that service, you should know what the policy is. There are cases in which like you never want to panic. And if you panic, that means the code should die. And we have a policy at Google, for example, that for unrecoverable errors, you don't panic, you use exit. End the process. At the point, if you, got, like, if you get to this line, end the process. That is the policy that I like. Like, unrecoverable errors, you kill the process. And instead for panics, you're basically saying, this is really bad, but I give you a chance to recover it but you should know in which case you are, because otherwise you need to write code not like this, uh, but like that. It's not a bad policy, but it's hard to hold, to hold it. Like, there are, in the standard library, there are recovers, so it's really hard to not, to not recover. The HP package has a root recover call. I like the policy, it's just hard to apply. Question over there. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, so I've written a bit of Go. I don't know much about the language, though. So is there any nice idea maybe to learn more about Go idiosyncrasies and uh, Go features, like as a project idea, some small project that I can do to learn more about Go specifically compared to other languages? So your question is, 
what is the best way to basically begin using Go and getting into it and learn from it? Maybe small projects that you can work on, something yeah, like that. Yeah, basically. Um, I don't know about small projects to do from scratch, but we are in October. So one good thing is look for Hacktober bugs, and you can start seeing like if there are any open source projects that you can start contributing to. If there is one thing that I've noticed is that the Go community is very welcoming from like um, issues, uh, pull requests and, and things like that. So definitely you can start working on a project that already exists and contributing code to it. And then if you want to build a new library and you think, is there a need for a new library? Is there a list of libraries that are needed? Because I know that, for example, Rust has a list of libraries that are missing, for example, for web. And you could just pick one and implement that one. I don't know if there is such a thing uh, for Go. Please don't write an HTTP router. Just, just, just okay. stop. But if, except for that, I guess you can just pick something that you think is missing, especially if you come from a different community. Find something that is in that ecosystem and not in the Go ecosystem and consider if maybe there is a need for that. That okay. is a good idea. Thank you. How are we doing with time? Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah, there is a question. You said that uh, yeah, usually you debug by using uh, print apps, print lines. And uh, I understand you also don't like logging packages. Uh, well, if you have some servers in production, I also guess that uh, you want to go back and trace back the errors that happen. So how come you don't like uh, logging packages? How, c how come you you haven't not found yet your uh, most lovable login package uh, of all time? Um, I love questions about login packages, thank you. Um, so it's not like I don't like all login packages. There are specific login packages that I don't like. Now, at Google, we have one login package, and you have to use that one. So currently, I, was, I use that for my, um, for my work code and for my personal code, I never get big enough to need structured logging. Um, but I would suggest to just pick something simple that doesn't overdo it. And that is what I would go for uh, logging libraries. And there is also the, such a thing as counters. So sometimes, as you said, you need to trace back what is going on in your code, but you don't need to log a line. Sometimes you just need to increment a counter. So you could have something in your server that just says, if I get to this line, increment that counter by one, and you expose them somehow internally. So you don't get with an infinite list of log lines. You just know when something happened and that it happened. Sometimes that is enough. I use that, to, that trick a lot, but when you need more information, yeah, go for structured logging and pick your poison. I think that the ghost under library logger is not the best, if, that, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> and I think that's it with the yeah, time. Um, that's the end of the talk. If you have any other questions, I think you can uh, ask yeah. to him later in yeah. the day. I'm always available to answer questions. Uh, I don't guarantee that the answers are correct, but uh, I try my best. And thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs>